Our training tonight from the Contract Enforcement Committee is on protecting your rights, grievances, and other ways to protect the contract and protect yourself. I'm going to turn it over to Mark Naden to do quick introductions of the folks who have worked on this presentation. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Um, we are um, on the uh, Contract Enforcement Committee. Um, our co chair is Tamisha King. Um, Lynn Romanek is um, our co chair at um, Samuel Ogle Middle School. My name is Mark Knighton. I, I'm a teacher at Suitland High School. We have Dottie Haslip. Um, who is a teacher at University Park Elementary. Uh, later, um, I don't think Dr. Wins will be able to join us tonight, but she's worked on this presentation. Uh, we know her as our PGCA vice president, and she is a pupil person personnel worker at uh, a few schools. And we have Gary Brennan, um, our Con, um, who's on the who's on the committee staff and is uh, one of our Uniserves, and we have Brian O'Neill who is also on staff and is uh, one of our mini serves um, Uniserves. Excuse me. Thanks, Mark. And really, the basis for our training tonight is going to be our negotiated uh, agreement. We currently have a three-year agreement that was is in effect, obviously, this year and will expire on June thirtieth. 2025. It's really important, uh, particularly if you think you have a grievance that you know how to get a hold of this document and see it. You can either get a hard copy uh, or it is online. And I'm going to um, put the link to the negotiated agreement in the chat that's on the um, PGCEA website. And so if you just go to the PGCEA website, pgcea.org, you can find it there, or the link is in the chat. I'm not sure if the Facebook folks can uh, get to that, but anyway, that's where it is. And before we start, we're going to do a little poll, uh, since we are focusing a lot of this presentation on uh, grievances. So I'm going to turn it over to Brian O'Neill, who's going to conduct uh, the first poll. Brian. Yep, thanks, Gary. So we're just gonna start off with a quick sort of pretest uh, poll question uh, folks can participate in. Bear with me, let me launch it. And of course, nothing but curveballs. Uh, we're gonna start off here with uh, the first question. Give you all a minute to uh, respond here. So, in which of these scenarios would it be most appropriate to initiate a level one grievance? So, we have A, um, trying to get the full question to. Can you see the, Gary, can you actually see the uh, entire answer? No, I see the start of it. So, I guess if you can read it. Yeah. I see it on my. Okay. You, you do see it on yours, Mark? Yeah, can, yeah, you, can you just read the entire? Uh, uh, the I'll be happy to. Um, okay, so the question is, in which of these scenarios would it be most appropriate to initiate a level one grievance? Um, a, a member states their, personal, their principal speaks in a disrespectful tone and is sending harassing emails every week about completing tasks. B, a member is absent. The students from the absent member's classroom are divided between two different classrooms. The principal splits the subpay between the two impacted members. A member states that they lost their planning time for the day due him oh, this is C. Um, a, a member states that they lost their planning time for the day due to an emergency where they were called upon to cover lunch duty. The principal said they would pay them substitute pay, but he, but then he probably didn't. <laughs> um, D, 
a member states that the 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 paraprofessional assigned to their classroom is not reporting to class, which leaves them in the classroom alone. The member is not receiving substitute pay, which is which is most appropriate to initiate to initiate a level one grievance. All right, so we'll see where we are. Um, we'll take about 30 seconds here uh, for responses and then we'll move forward. All right, so we're going to end the poll. Nobody got that one correct. The correct answer is actually uh, C. You want to explain that, or wait until after we go over the next part? Yeah, we can. Uh, we can wait until we go after uh, the the next part, just to just to actually. Let me let me check here. Let me make sure that nobody got this correct here. Oh, I see. I got it right. Actually, <clears throat> no, actually, actually, the, the correct answer is B. So a member is absent. The students from the absent member's classroom uh, are split between two remaining educators. So we know that um, substitute pay is not supposed to be prorated and split uh, between between colleagues. So if <clears throat> if an educator is absent and those remaining um, students are split between two uh other educators who are present, um, both of those educators are entitled to $30 an hour um, for their substitute pay, the full strength substitute pay. It does not get split uh, between colleagues. So that's the explanation. All right, thank you. Yep. All right. Um, I'm gonna go over the, the, the next uh, oh, piece hi. of this. Gary, I'm here so I can do that. Oh, okay. Hi, this is Lynn Romanek, and I work at Samuel Local Middle School. I'm the FAC chair at that school, and it's an honor to be on this committee, and we're going to talk about the grievance procedure and the goals. The goal of a grievance procedure is to secure at the lowest possible level an equitable solution to complaints and or grievances that may arrive from time to time. Both parties agree that these proceedings shall be kept confidential at each level of this procedure. Every effort must be exhausted at each step before appealing to the next step. A grievance in any unsettled complaint by a Unit 1 member or by PGCEA on its own behalf of an alleged violation or misinterpretation of the agreement. So that's what the grievance procedure entails, the beginning. So what is a grievance? What is not a grievance? A grievance is something that has already occurred. It violates the language of the contract. So you always need to refer to the contract to determine if it is indeed a grievance. And it has not been resolved through discussion with administration. So <clears throat> the first step is to talk to administration. Um, you might want to have someone with you when you talk so they can take notes if you're in a, a state that might be emotional. So they have you have a clear head with you as well, but you discuss with your administration first. And then if you cannot come to an agreeable solution, then it moves to the grievance state. What is considered a gripe or just a complaint? Something that is upsetting, unfair, or poor management but is not covered by the contract. If you cannot find it in that contract, it is not a grievance. Go to the contract before you say, think to yourself, oh, this is definitely a grievance. Look at that contract. A general problem that can't be solved by the contract. I don't like my principal. I don't like my coworkers. 
She had an attitude when she came at me, she came into my room and was nasty. That kind of thing is not a grievance, um, is a potential contract violation. Again, make sure it is a clear cut violation, no gray area, or it's not gonna be looked upon as a grievance. And a problem you have with the contract as it is stated, the contract is the contract. If you are not happy with the contract, that's nothing you can grieve. It is what we have agreed upon as a union. Thanks. And one thing I just would add to that is just because something is a gripe or complaint doesn't mean you can't do anything about it. It just means you can't grieve it. It might be something to take to the FAC. It might be something you want to bring to your Uniserve and have a meeting to try to work through, uh, et cetera. But it, it might be something you appeal uh, because it's something you think is arbitrary and capricious. But we're just saying these things do not make a grievance. And again, just to, to reinforce that when it comes to the grievance, it's got to be rooted in the contract language, either with something that was done, denied, misinterpreted, or ignored, but it is clearly in the language and covered by the contract. Right. And the perfect example is when we talked about splitting the subpay. You look in the contract, it says when classes are dispersed, each teacher gets the full amount of that sub coverage pay. So if that occurs, you have it right there in the contract language, and that is something that you can show to your administrator. And again, remember, the contract has changed quite a bit from last year to this year, and so some things have changed. You know, for example, we talked about, uh, I've still had people that call and say, hey, how come I'm not getting my lunch duty pay? That part of the contract doesn't exist anymore. So you, that, that even though you might have liked it, that part has been changed. Oops. When in doubt, talk to your unit, sir. Mm -hmm. This is yours, Mark. Oh, sorry. Um, let's see. Um, grievances must uh, uh, adhere to a strict uh, timeline set out in the ne negotiated agreement. Um, the idea is they want to process it as quickly as possible. Um, the number of days indicated at each level shall be regarded as a maximum and, and every effort shall be made to expedite the process. However, time limits specified may be extended by mutual agreement between PGCA and the administration. Um, during the summer, sometimes they play fast and loose and they it, I've seen them play fast and loose anyway. So <laughs> it's important that you um adhere to the the time limits of the contract so if you think you have a grievance and you've determined what next so you have a contract violation the principle is um shorting people on their planning time or uh has given a secondary teacher five preps without any uh discussion or a uh, chance to provide some sort of relief. Uh, what do you do next? The most important thing you should do is speak to your building rep first about the grievancy, if you can get their support. If you're going to try to, to talk to the principal uh, without your Uniserve director, have your uh, building rep go. I really recommend that the building rep be asked to attend with you to take notes uh, make sure that they're writing down any solutions or they're clearly writing down the administrator's response. Uh, but also, if you think you do have a contract violation, call your Uniserve uh, director. Um, and if you don't know who your Uniserve director, Unisurv director is, if you go on the PGCEA website, you can find uh, a link that lists all the buildings and who are the Uniserve directors assigned uh, to that building. You also want to start preparing for your conversation with your principal. And so the first, oops, uh, the first part of uh, the, the uh, any grievance you might have is level one. It's described in article five of the contract. And the first step is the informal meeting with the administrator. It is informal. It is not a trial. It is not, you know, a, 
a tribunal against the administrator. It's you bringing forward what you believe is a violation of the contract and giving the principal or the administrator an opportunity to fix that violation. So the first step is within eight days of the alleged wrong, you sit down and you talk to your administrator. Now, some wrongs are kind of ongoing, right? But if it's a single time thing, you want to address it within eight days. But if it's something that keeps occurring, maybe you didn't really, you, you let it go the first time, but now it's continuing to happen, then uh, you have eight, eight days really from the last time it occurred or the time that it occurred. Um, again, you don't go to the meeting by yourself. You have the right to either bring your union rep, that could be your building rep, FAC chair, or your Uniserv director uh, into that meeting with you. Gary, I have a question. Um, <laughs> if you contact the the principal, let's say, um, by email, would that does that count? Only if you state that in lieu of a meeting, this is my level one uh, meeting with you, you can respond or can we sit down and talk? But generally you should have a face-to-face -face conversation. But if the principal doesn't respond, uh, doesn't set the meeting or keeps kind of postponing and blowing off the meeting, there is again, a timeline for the principal to respond. But you can't just say, oh, I mentioned it to the principal when I passed him in the hallway, or I sent him an email and said, hey, I didn't get my planning today. That's not agree. That's not giving them a chance to really respond. Generally, it should be a face-to-face -face meeting. And you should let them know. This is yeah. to discuss a potential violation of the contract. Let them know what it is, and, and why you want to talk to them. Thank you. So to have a successful level one uh, grievance meeting, and I'm hoping Tamisha is still not here because I'm taking her. I, <laughs> she, she, okay. Um, keys to successful level one grievance meeting. First, be prepared. Think about what it is. Be prepared. What exactly was the violation? Uh, have an agenda either written out or clearly in your mind of how the meeting is going to go. Share the specific contract language that was violated with the uh, with the administrator. Don't expect them to know uh, what it is. Tell them exactly this Article Seven, Section, you know, D, Letter Two. Bring that contract with you and show it to them, or print out that section of the contract so that they can see it. And if you follow up with an email, certainly put that uh, language into your email. Describe in clear language the nature of the contract violation. What did they do wrong? What was their either misinterpretation? What did they ignore? What did they maybe just not know when they made the decision or took the action that they did? Provide any supporting documentation, emails, schedules, witness statements, et cetera, during the meeting, if you have anything to support your claim uh, of the contract violation. I'm seeing right now uh, a, a number of violations of the co new contract language on formal observations and evaluations. A lot of principals are rushing to get their final observations done, and some of them are violating uh, new contract language. And in some cases, they don't know. That's not an excuse, right? So uh, if you bring in that contract language and show you observe me on, you know, April 1st, you didn't schedule my post observation conference until April 20th. That's a contract violation that could result in that um, observation being rescinded. Bring someone with you to act as a witness and take notes. I can't stress this enough. Don't have this meeting alone, A, because you want to focus on the conversation while someone else uh, takes the notes. And if it's just you and an administrator, then there could be a kind of a, you know, uh, they said, they said kind of back and forth about what occurred at that meeting. Stay calm and professional. Don't make it personal, right? Even if you're upset about it, it's, you know, it never helps to go in there yelling, being rude, or uh, making disparaging comments. If Even if you feel it's personal, don't make this meeting personal. Stick to the facts. Don't make assumptions. 
or assign motives. You know, don't say things like you're always trying to get me, right? Or uh, you just always want to screw us over. That's you assigning motives to the administrator. Assume, you know, that they had good intentions, but they're wrong, right? It's okay to tell someone they're wrong. It never helps to say, you know, you're trying to screw me over or you're doing something underhanded. Have a clear ask. What do you want to have this resolved? And is what you're asking for in terms of it being resolved related to the infraction? And is what you're asking for in proportion to the infraction that you see? And the goal is to fix it. Remember, a grievance can only be made for something that happened in the past. You can't go back in time. I'll have a lot of people say, oh, I want the principal to write a letter to the whole staff saying I was wrong. That's not going to fly. That's not going to work. It is what can they do to fix it moving forward? If it's monetary, make sure that you get the money. For example, we've had a lot of issues with subpay. The best resolution is pay me what you owe me, right? If it's planning time, fix it going forward. If it's you kept us over time on the staff meeting, you wouldn't let us leave, then the next meeting could be shorted that amount of time, right? It's not about getting a pound of flesh. It's about trying to resolve the, the problem so it doesn't happen again. And whatever reparation that makes sense can be made uh, for the infraction. Yeah, Gary, um, mm -hmm. can you go back to, to the previous slide? Sure. Um, uh, just I I I listen to what you're saying, and this doesn't seem very informal to me. Um, when I think of informal, I think you know getting together with a cup of coffee. So <laughs> just just you know just people note that that when we say informal, it's not that informal. Well, we mean there's not going to be a stenographer there. It's not like you're going to be you know uh, having you know a formal uh, statements, rebuttals, timing. You're right, Mark. There are certain things you want. It's a good point. There's certain things you need to make sure occur at the meeting. So that you're right. In that sense, it's formal. And it's formal in the sense that you're going there prepared to be very clear in what happened, what was violated, and what you want done so that the problem can be resolved. So good, good point. Yeah, it's not casual like, hey, you go in there and you're just kicking your putting your feet up on their desk and you know uh drinking your coffee with them. No, it's 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 different than that. After the grievance meeting, hopefully you'll have a resolution. Put any agreements to resolve the contract violation in writing. This can be an email. It doesn't need to be a legal document. It could be a, a, an email after. So this is what I took from our meeting. You know, this is what you're going to stop doing. This is what you're going to do in the future. This is when I can expect to get paid for the money that's owed. And that, that should be in writing and agreed upon by both parties. Memorialize the timeline for the resolution and be sure it's met right? It could be, okay, my, my planning time is not exactly right. And by it's Monday today, by Wednesday, the schedule is going to be changed in a way that I get my full planning time. So I'm agreeing for the next day, I'm going to still not get my full planning, but by Wednesday, it is going to be resolved. If no agreement is reached, contract your Uniserv director so they can file a step two grievance on the appropriate form. So if you're at the point where um, you, you they either what they offer is not suitable, it's not meeting your needs, or the um, they're just saying, no, I'm right, you're wrong, I think I'm not in violation of the contract, then you should contact your Uniserv director. So uh, uh, the, the paper, the official formal uh, complaint can be prepared and submitted. The step two grievance must be filed within 10 business days of the level one grievance meeting. And that can also be if they don't meet with you and you've requested a meeting, if they don't respond in 10 days, you can go to the level two uh, formal complaint right? If they just ignore your concerns. Okay, we have another poll question. Yeah. 
So this next question is going to lead us into the next section around just cause and due process. Uh, so it's a pretest. Um, if you want this one here. Are you able to see that one? Mm -hmm. All right, great. <clears throat> so we'll give you a minute to answer this one. Um, the question is, which one of these would not constitute a violation of just cause or due process in Maryland? So A, a principal issues a member a corrective action document in the form of a letter of professional counseling without affording them representation from the association. B, a timely 6202 appeal is filed to contest the recommendation for a three-day suspension of a member, but the suspension is carried out before the hearing is scheduled to take place. C, a principal issues a corrective action letter in the form of a reprimand without affording the member representation from the association. And then D, after notification, a conditionally certified educator with two effective end of year evaluations has their contract non-renewed by PGTPS with no reason provided. Or E, both A and D. So we'll give you about 30 seconds or so. Uh, again, the question is which one of these would not constitute a violation of just cause of due process in Maryland? So. Go ahead. All right, there's another couple of folks that get your answer in here. And this is a hard question because we don't always encounter this. Um, this is a little bit more intricate than the, the, the first question. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll, um, share the results. Uh, unfortunately, nobody got the correct answer here. The correct answer is actually uh, both A and B. So just to explain that a little bit further, um, when a principal issues a member something that is non-disciplinary and fashion, uh, in terms of corrective action, uh, you're not entitled to representation for that. So a reprimand is, we see in letter C, uh, reprimand is uh, disciplinary in nature. A letter of professional counseling is not, right? So A would not be a violation of just cause of due process. And then D, uh, conditionally certified educators, it uh, doesn't matter if they have great performance, doesn't matter if they're a great fit for the school. Uh, in Maryland, the school system has, in, in PGCPS, all throughout Maryland, they have the ability to non-renew, uh, which is different than termination, right? Because they're simply not renewing your contract for the next year. Uh, there is no uh, reason that needs to be provided for that. Uh, and there is no due process in terms of, uh, you know, an appeal uh, lane for you to file that. Um, if that happens and you're, uh, and you're conditionally certified, uh, the system can non-renew you during your uh, non-tenure status. So that's the answer, both A and B. Okay, we're going to take kind of a quick break from the grievance process to talk a little bit more about due process. Probably one of the most common uh, issues people have with their rights as an employee has to do with when they are being disciplined by their administrator and your rights to due process. You have due process rights, A, because you live in a state that does allow um, bargaining for public school employees. And so the contract guarantees that you are going to be treated with due process, but also Maryland law guarantees due process for educators. It's in uh, the um, education section of Comar. So in this little cartoon here, without due cause, it means they can do it to you because they want to do it to you. With just cause, they have to follow certain rules and procedures if they feel that you've done something that needs to be addressed through discipline. So Oliver Wendell Holmes, the Supreme Court Justice said, whatever disagreement there may be, may be as to the scope of the phrase due process of law, or in our case, due process in the workplace, there can be no doubt that it embraces the fundamental conception of a fair trial with an opportunity to be heard. 
You have a right to know what your administrator is saying is a possible violation of school systems, policies, procedures, uh, uh, job expectations, et cetera. And you have the right to respond uh, to the, those things. In uh, labor law in general, there are seven tests of just cause that should be used whenever we look at how someone's being treated in cases of discipline. The first is that you get notice that whatever it is that you violated, that you should have known you were violating it. Not like, you know, in the sense of, oh, no one exactly told me I shouldn't steal paper from the workroom. That, you know, that's sort of applied, but that there are policies and procedures the school system has, and they have a duty to allow you or, or to make sure you have at least know how to become aware of those policies, procedures, and expectations. And Brian will know whenever we go now to Loudermill or due process hearings, one of the things they always ask is, are you a familiar with the PGCPS employee code of conduct? That document, which I think is sort of a crazy document the way it was put together, but it was created as a way that the school systems can say, we do give notice to our employees of the policies, procedures, and expectations we have of them as employees of the school system. Second, the rule that you're told to have uh, broken has to be a reasonable rule or order, right? So they can't discipline you because you didn't say hello with a smile on your face to an administrator, right? That's not reasonable. You don't have to have a smile on your face. You don't even have to say hello to someone if you choose not to. It's nice to say hi. I encourage you to, but you don't have to. Um, or because the principal said, um, basically, you need to change that student's test scores on a state test. That would not be a reasonable rule or order because it would violate all kinds of state laws and rules from the State Board of Education. There has to be an investigation. They can't just uh, uh, buy, uh, 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 put discipline on somebody without an investigation of any allegation. That's part of the job of school security, uh, the security services of PGCPS, uh, security at your school, and also uh, employee labor and relations office. There has to be some proof that you did what they said that you did. Without proof, there should not be uh, discipline. And they have to apply rules uh, equally, right? They can't let some uh, teachers uh, come in late and others get punished for. We hear that all the time. But if you're going to say, I'm late every day, but my other employees, but my co-workers are not punished for that. A, you're admitting you're doing something that's against the rules. But B, you'd have to be able to show and prove that those people aren't getting punishment, right? You can't just say it. You would have to find uh, proof of that. But, you, but rules are to be applied equally uh, by the employer. And then uh, that there is a penalty and the penalty has to fit uh, the infraction. In Prince George's County, they generally uh, use the standard uh, progressive discipline. So penalties are not supposed to start with the most severe punishment, but should start with the lowest level of punishment, which is some kind of warning to the, uh, uh, to the uh, person who might have committed the infraction. Now, that doesn't mean they can't jump right to a more severe. If it's a very severe coming to work inebriated, uh, hitting a student or a colleague, those kinds of things. They're not going to give you a warning on that, and no one would expect them to. But for example, coming in a couple minutes late, they would not expect someone to be uh, suspended without pay on the very first infraction like that. And just basically, just cause is defined, um, well, just cause and due process. Uh, basically, if to be terminated, from your job or to be suspended. Those are the two um, biggest punishments the school system can enact. Suspend you without pay from one to seven days or terminate your employment. 
and they can only terminate your employment. And we're going to get into a little more specifically based on certain things. I'm not going to read that uh, here. Due process is also uh, based on principles of the U.S. Constitution found in the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. First off, I also want to note when if you feel your due process rights were violated, besides the appeals we're going to talk about, you can also uh, grieve a violation of due process because it is a part of your contract rights. So under Education Article 6202 of COMAR, the Maryland Annotated Code, under Maryland Education Article 6202, a teacher or other educator can be suspended or terminated for the following. So if it doesn't fit one of these cat categories legally, it doesn't, it, it can't fly. One, immorality. That's a big vague statement, but it is still part of the law. If the school system can show that your actions were immoral, were far outside of the code of what is acceptable, some people get caught for things that they put on social media or that they do outside of their job because the school system says that behavior was immoral to such a degree that it became an issue in your work, right? So uh, that would be one. Misconduct in office, including knowingly failing to report suspected child abuse. We all know that, right? Uh, educators are mandatory reporters of any suspected child abuse. Insubordination, another one. And insubordination is one of those insubordination can be in the eye of the beholder. And sometimes an administrator will think someone was insubordinate, but can't prove it. That would be what would happen during a just cause hearing. Was that action actually insubordinate? But insubordination, if proven, can lead to uh, uh, someone being uh, getting disciplined. Incompetency, someone just not doing or being able to do their work. Willful neglect of duty, not turning in grades, not uh, showing up on time, uh, not putting an absence in, that all could be considered willful neglect of duty. If you are ever suspended or terminated based on any of those conditions or any of those things I just described, you do have the right under Maryland law to uh, request an appeal to the Prince George's County Board of Education or an arbitrator. It's called a 6202 appeal. If you get a day of suspension, you have a right to appeal that suspension before it's applied. Any 6202 appeal, you have 10 days from the date of the decision when you were informed, not the date it was made, the day you were informed of that decision, to, uh, uh, you can appeal. A unit member has the right to counsel and to bring witnesses to the appeal hearing. If you're an MSEA member, which you are, if you're a PGCEA member, you will have a legal, you'll have legal counsel provided by the state, uh, our state union. You also have the right, for example, in a reprimand. A reprimand is the lowest form of discipline but you do have the right to appeal reprimands and really any other uh, administrative decision that impacts you in a negative way. Unit members also have the right to appeal reprimand administrative decision that impacts you. It can't be, oh, I don't like what you did to my friend, so I want a 4205 appeal. It has to impact you. But you have the right to appeal any um, reprimand, uh, which is a form of discipline, or another decision that negatively impacts you. If the reprimand or decision was issued by a principal or other administrator, the appeal is first heard by what we now call the CEO, but next year we'll be calling the superintendent. Yay. <laughs> Reprimands issued by the superintendent go straight to the Board of Education. So if your principal issues you a reprimand, your appeal would start with the superintendent or CEO. Uh, but if it is, uh, for example, most reprimands that come out of a due process or Loudermill meeting with ELRO are signed by the superintendent, that would go straight to the Board of Education. Members have 30 days to file a 4205. So if you get a reprimand, you would have 30 days to file an appeal. Remember, you can also file a grievance if you believe due process wasn't filed. You can file a 4205 appeal because you disagree. You think the decision was arbitrary and capricious. You think it's a wrong decision. You can only grieve a uh, issue with discipline if you believe your due process rights weren't respected and followed. 
Okay, so now we're going to switch to, so we're going to go back to grievances. And we're on level two grievances. And Mark is going to talk to us about this. Okay, so I like to go that step one was the informal, which we're using that uh, light, that term lightly. Uh, <laughs> step two um, is talking about the the decision maker here is going to be the supervisor um and in the event well, give me a second here um lock on my screen um if they're not satisfied with the oral conference um within the eight days the grievance is in writing a form um provided by pgca within 10 days of the said conference um um, and I do recommend this. If the grief person so choose, we hope they will choose a PGCE representative will assist in writing the claim. So um, they can, they can. I've seen it happen where they, you know, you leave a phrase out or something and they dismiss it on that. So please run that through PGCEA. Um, within 10 days, the principal. Uh, will on the form provided write a response. And I just here's what it looks like. People are always asking if you need a copy of a grievance uh, or you want to file one. As as Mark said, contact your Unicert director. Um, I, I add to that. Mm -hmm. And when the let me ask a question, Gary. When the principal makes this decision, we'll call it. Um, can we at that point uh, post a rebuttal to that decision to that decision the supervisor made? No, you either need to accept their decision or you need to move it to the next level. Now, once you move it to the next level, you could resolve it anyway and then just say, OK, we're ending the grievance because it's been resolved. And you would then put in writing. We did manage, but you don't you don't kind of stop and negotiate here. The principal writes their response, and then you either accept that response, or if you say they're still not agreeing with what it is you're asking for, they're still saying they did not violate the contract, then you would go to a level three grievance. Okay, so if, if you disagree with this, should you sign this document? That's my question. You, you don't. The only signature on this part of it is the signature of the signature of the um, this signature here is for filing the official grievance, and then your Unicer director would sign here. The, the then the principal or uh, supervisor writes their response. They're the only ones who sign their response. You Got don't it. sign their response. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Dottie. Oh, you're, you're, my, you're, you're, uh, sorry about that. No, you're good. Um, for level three grievance, if you've gone through level one and level two, and you're still not satisfied with how things have been turning out, this is when we go to level three. It's getting serious. It's an HR decision. And we have 15 business days after level two in order to respond. And this is where a copy is sent to the chief human resources officer, and one is also sent to PGCEA. In addition, we need to contact um, our um, associate superintendent, and I will put the that email in the uh, chat once I'm done talking about this. All right, and then it, it is outlined in our contract exactly what we need to do. So the chief human resources officer will have 20 business days from then, not calendar days, from receipt of the grievance to have a decision. And then um, during any part of this, and especially in level three grievance, if it would be really wise to have our Uniserve person there with us to make sure that uh, things are going the way they should be in an order. And it is at this level as well that uh, copies are sent um, 
whoever signs it, the associate superintendent, the chief resource officer, copies are sent to every person, the aggrieved person, as well as the person that the complaint and grievance, excuse me, is against, as well as PGCEA. So this is where everybody is getting all the communication and the final decision is to be coming from the HR. And now we're gonna have a poll, I believe, with Brian. Yep, so we got the third and final poll question. And if you all are paying attention to Dottie, everybody should get this right because this was referenced um, in the previous slide. So I'm gonna load this up here. Bear with me. Okay, so this is uh, pretty simple. How many days does the, does the association have to provide a written request for arbitration? A, 15 business days. B, five calendar days. C, seven business days. D, 10 calendar days. So we'll give you all just a few seconds to uh, put your answers in. All right. So, yep, everybody that participated actually got that correct. The answer is A, 15 business days. That's what you have. Uh, that's what the association has to provide written requests for arbitration at level four. Okay, so the last step, if we can't get a um, issue resolved, uh, oh, I'm going to, uh, Dottie has asked that we include the uh, email address of the Chief of Human Resources. I'm going to put this in here. The Chief Human Resources Officer is Dr. Christy Baldwin. And so she and she is the one that um, all grievances at level three go to. Okay, step four, the final step is arbitration. And Mark, this is yours. Okay, so this is uh, as far as it goes, folks. Um, <laughs> if we're not satisfied with the decision of HR, um, step three. Uh, we may, well, I'll explain that in a minute, go, there's no guarantee that we're going to go go to arbitration. Um, and um, I've talked about this in class. Um, I put the picture of Judge Judy here because it's, it's really what it's like. Um, both parties agree, rather than to go to court, that an arbitrator will make the decision. Okay, um, um, This is not, you know, this is very much like Judge Judy, right? Like say at the beginning, they've, and they've taken their, you know, they've taken their case out of court in order to let Judge Judy decide. Okay, it's a similar thing. Not going to court. Instead, the arbitrator will decide. Okay, so uh, let's see. Here's how it works. Um, I just might not have personal experience with this. So, um, <laughs> um, okay, first, labor and management need to agree on and pay for this is a uh, particular arbitrator to judge the case um so in order because it's going to cost money to both sides um the union has agreed to it management has to agree to it um so that's why i say it may go to arbitration and, and just to put an exclamation point on that when it says it costs money it is not cheap these people are highly trained uh there's not very many of them and you pay thousands of dollars per hour for their time Yes. Um, uh, the complaint that would be you um, will work with a lawyer to prepare for the ar arbitration hearing. This is the trial alternative. Management will have an attorney as well. Um, and um, you do spend, having been through this, you do spend time with um, uh, your lawyer. Do not be shy. Um, you know, uh, my lawyer was excellent um and you don't have to hire a lawyer that's uh the union shop yeah currently the lawyer that would most likely represent you is damon felton 
He works for uh, MSEA, is one of their councils, and uh, he works as a sign uh, to PGCEA cases. Yeah, he's excellent. Um, okay, so this is kind of weird, um, but this is how it works. The employment folders are then open for both sides to examine. Okay, Evidence is presented as if in a trial. Witnesses can be called as if in a trial on both sides. Um, Oh, okay. I get that Sixth Amendment right in a minute. Um, so, and you, your user will go over this with you. But um, it, this is serious stuff. Uh, like I say, they come to play, and uh, we do too. So, um, again, this is an involved process. So, gather the evidence when they open up the files, uh, like they did in mine. Um, they will find things you did not expect. <laughs> um, so um, talk with your lawyer about it um, and, and please have your witnesses uh, ready to go. Um, again, um, anyway, I put it again. Uh, prior to arbitration hearing, you will meet with your lawyer um, and just, who was excellent and discuss the evidence. He will ask for witnesses and evidence. And what happened with me is I had several witnesses and um our our lawyer decided you know to choose some and not others and you know should not take it personally um but uh but be prepared to uh, to get witnesses okay what to expect at arbitration oh okay okay so again it looks very much like a trial um there's the complaint um there's a defendant Witnesses are literally sworn in the whole the whole nine yards. It's it's really kind of dramatic, just like on TV, honestly. Right, this is key. Um, expect not so subtle attacks on your character. Um, their <laughs> their lawyer, and in my case, they came to play. And believe me, it wasn't any fun. <laughs> um, and uh. Our lawyer did, was great. He did not lose his temper. Um, and you shouldn't lose your temper either. Stay cool. Um, you know, realize, even though it's very hard to when you when it's you, um, that their lawyer is playing a role. And uh, and they will attack you personally in, in ways I did not expect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's put it that yeah, way. They're, they're, their lawyer will try to get you to slip up to, to say something that undercuts your case, just as your lawyer will do for their witnesses, whether it be the principal or whoever they call, then obviously your attorney is going to try to get them to slip up in what they have to say. And mind you, I won. Okay. <laughs> so um so expect, you know, expect um um attacks on your character. Uh you can uh confer with the MSCA lawyer during the hearing. Uh, I rec recommend that you do so. Um <laughs> as much as you want. Um, and we even had an argument about that. They were like, um, this, mine was online, by the way. So uh, we used the chat function. And they were like, well, why are you using the chat function? And the arbitrator said, oh, they can do that. It's just like if you were at a, a trial, you would be able to confer with your lawyer, um, you know, by whispering to him. So, so uh, then, your, then your advice, Mark, is to confer with your lawyer as much as possible to make the other side nervous. I. <laughs> uh, Yes, <laughs> logical play there. Yeah, well, I, honestly, when, in my case, I, I really had a question. Like, sh should we bring this up? Should we bring that up? Um, I didn't do it like you're like you're saying that to, to be an irritant. Yeah, to play. <laughs> you no, know, I did it honestly. I was like, what is going on? What is this? What is that? Yeah, uh, but it's good to know that you should not feel you know, embarrassed or that you're being, you know, overstepping your rights because these are your rights and I'm sure they will try to make it feel like you don't have this right. Yes, exactly. Um, oh, yeah, and it, this is, it's pretty, again, it's really like a trial. I mean, I've, you know, I've been on the jury. I, I know what trials are like. I teach government um, and it is very similar to a trial. Um, it's shorter, but not much. Okay, I expect this to last several hours, and um, because basically, to to be to be blunt, um, they didn't have a case. Um, it was very clear that they didn't have a case, so they kept trying to extend the hearing 
to try to find uh to try to get me to do whatever you know to make me look bad again the kind of play I just finished an, an arbitration that lasted two days. It was 9.30 until I think 4.30 the first day. We didn't even break for lunch. We had some 10-minute breaks. And then from 9.30 till almost 1 o'clock on the second day. So these can be pretty lengthy. And they're still doing a lot of them online. I think that's kind of a, a permanent change coming out of um, COVID. That's good. I'm I'm for that. Okay. What to expect after arbitration? Okay, so um, unlike here, so it's unlike this kind of I thought was weird. Unlike at a trial, um, which is decided, you know, um, within a day or two, um, an arbitrator can write is more like a Supreme Court justice. They they can they can wait weeks to to come up with their opinion, and they will. Okay, um, and the opinion is not unlike again, not unlike if you ever seen a Supreme Court opinion, it's not unlike that. Um, they talk about both sides. Um, um, our lawyers had great, had, you know, it's, there's pre it's all like, like real. There's precedence. Um, both sides will cite precedence. Our side did an excellent job. Um, and they will, they will um, come up with like a 10 page decision, something like that. Um, maybe one that wasn't that long, but it seemed to. Um, now, oddly in my case, this was really weird. Management appealed the decision, even though there's no appeals process in arbitration, <laughs> but they did it anyway. Um, so what they did, once the arbitrator came up with the decision, they asked the arbitrator to reconsider his opinion, uh, which he did. Um, he wrote a follow-up opinion, which took another week or two, which, by the way, totally reaffirmed what the first what their opinion was, which I won. But but Mark is, is, is alluding to a good point. Their decision is final both before you go into the arbitration you're agreeing that you're going to follow whatever the arbitrator decides okay and um despite the fact that i won my case pretty easily um keep this in mind in arbitration unlike court there is incentive for the arbitrator not to be extreme with his opinion okay and there's there's actually um financial reasons for this um if they if Remember, both sides have to agree on an arbitrator, okay? Um, and if the, the arbitrator rules very favorably to one side, well, the other side might say, well, we're not going to hire this guy next time because, you know, he he was so pro-union in the last in the last one. So don't take the, I, I will say, as, I'll keep on emphasizing this, don't take this personally. Um, they're going to present both sides uh, the arbitrator would have both sides in, in the opinion. Um, but again, don't expect, you know, don't expect, you know, total vindication <laughs> because of that that reason. That arbitrator wants to be hired again by the county, by the union. So um, so um yeah. <laughs> okay, we're at that that's the end of the presentation. We we uh do maybe have a couple minutes for questions. I'm gonna have to turn it over though to Lynn and, and Brian and Mark and Dottie and Amanda, because I have a 7.30 appointment I have to go to. So uh, I'm, I'm out. Uh, but thank you, everybody, uh, at least for me, for your participation. Lynn, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. OK, thank you so much. And thanks, Gary, for all the, the information and all this, uh, the side um, little tips we need here. And uh, does anyone have any questions? Please put them in the chat. We can have some general questions if you uh, audience needs to talk about anything that's pressing. If we can answer it, we will certainly do that. Nope, I don't see anything in the chat. This reminds me of the end of school when <laughs> people don't want to participate. <laughs> right. Well, I hope that uh, everybody who's been watching has, has gotten a little more of an understanding of the grievance process and your rights. And I think one of the big takeaways, particularly hearing about Mark's personal experience, is that um, you need to remember that 
you have rights and don't let other people intimidate you thinking you do not. Yeah, I'm going to add here um, that I know I said a lot of bad things that might happen, but honestly, I'm glad I did it. Um, you know, you, you, you will feel, even if you lose, you're going to feel better that you just didn't sit back and take it, that you, you went through the process and I can't emphasize enough to be in contact with your Unisur, with your Unisurf, they know the contract, they know all these calendar dates that you have to um, adhere to, um, but uh, know your rights. I, I just want to add and reiterate the comment that we've been saying the whole time about um, looking at the calendar days and making sure that you do things within the window of time that you have. I've seen people before say, oh, well, yeah, that happened last month or that happened, you know, back in January. Well, that's too late. Whenever you have the grievance, you need to make sure that you begin the grievance process. Anything to add there, Brian? No, we'll say it. Well stated. Yeah, some grievances, some situations um, recur over and over again, weekly basis. If you're, for instance, missing planning time and that continues to happen, there's always a window to file the grievance. But you're right, Dottie, that some of the more time sensitive sort of singular instances that we have to capitalize on to make sure that we uphold the negotiated agreement. For sure. Complete. Know your contract and, um, and defend it and defend it. Right, and if you have any questions, always contact your Unisurf because there are no stupid questions. We are here to do whatever we can to help you as soon as we can. I see that Brian put the link to find a Unisurf director if you don't know who he or she is. Uh, check that at, out that link, as well as it can also be found on PGCEA uh, right there on the opening page, I believe. All right, so we'll wrap up and this will be available. I think it's gonna be posted probably on YouTube, other social media uh, for colleagues that missed tonight as well. So um, in conclusion, we thank you all and uh, take care. Thank you, everybody. Please reach out, we're here. Good night. Good night.